Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. My name is Dylan Brewer and I'm a student worker here at the Biotech Center. On behalf of the Biotechnology Center, UW-Madison Division of Extension, PBS Wisconsin, Wisconsin Alumni Association, and UW-Madison Science Alliance, welcome to Wednesday Night at the Lab. This is the last Wednesday Night at the Lab before long-term hiatus. It is my pleasure of introducing Fernando De La Torre. Tonight he will be sharing about vaccinium hybrids. Before we get started, we're going to ask him a couple questions. Fernando, where were you born? I was born in Los Angeles, California, right. yes. And where did you attend high school? Um, Chula Vista High School uh, in South Bay, San Diego. All right. Where did you go for undergrad? Uh, I went to UCLA. And what did you study there? It's a big, long title, but Molecular <laughs> Cell Developmental Biology. Oh, we wow. Call it MCDB. That's what we <laughs> There call we it. go. Yeah. And where did you go for any advanced degrees? Well, I'm currently doing that now, mm -hmm. here. Awesome, good place to be. <laughs> Great place to be, yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Fernando De La Torre. Good evening, everybody. You know, I, I was just introduced. My name is Fernando De La Torre. Uh, I'm excited to be giving this uh, public lecture to everybody today. Um, if you haven't done so, feel free to take some cranberries and blueberries here. We're going to participate, if you want to participate in a tasting later. Um, I guess I'll start by saying that every time I tell people about my research that I cross blueberries with cranberries, 100% of the time people ask me, uh, what do they look like? So I'm just going to kick us off and show you what they look like. Um, let's see. Yes. So. Uh, you see in the in the middle, actually on the top right hand corner is a cranberry. If, if you know, and in Wisconsin we know them very well. Uh, and then below that a blueberry, and then in the center there we have a blueberry by cranberry hybrid fruit. Um, and you might appreciate that you know they don't really quite look like any of the two parents. They look quite intermediate. Um, and so I'll be talking more about these plants uh, later on in the presentation. Um, but I think it's, it's fun to talk about berries with people. I think um, people, most people uh, conceptual, can use berries to conceptualize something very common that we do in agriculture, which is called uh, hybridization. And hybridization is one of the methods that plant breeders use to systematically improve the edible parts of crop plants uh, for human consumption. And uh, hybridization can lead to um, the increase of size or flavor of a berry um, or improvement of similar characteristics. So with, like I said, with berries, it's very easy to visualize because I think people intuitively understand that to breed a blueberry with a cranberry is like trying to bring together the best qualities of each into a single fruit. But to accomplish hybridization, uh, we have to mate two distinct plants. Um, and that hasn't always been easy for blueberries and cranberries, and the path forward wasn't, wasn't really uh, revealing itself until about five years ago. Um, even though blueberries and cranberries are very closely related species, um, they, they are sufficiently distinct to deter interspecific hybridization. So interspecific hybridization is a term that we use to describe when two distinct species come together to produce offspring. Uh, the blueberry and the cranberry are two distinct species, and the challenge of interspecific hybridization, especially with two fruits as unique as a blueberry and a cranberry, is to find two parents that can come together and produce enough hybrid offspring that then we can select from. So that's the story of what we do at the US, USDA Cranberry Genetics and Genomics Laboratory uh, here in Madison. Um, we dedicate some of our resources to finding plants within the group called uh, genus vaccinium that includes cranberries and blueberries um, to find compatible uh, pairs of plants to produce hybrid offspring. Um, and one of our goals, of course, is to produce uh, hybrid populations and extend them into second and third generation so that we can select the best ones for um, cultivation. So that plant that you see there is, is the one that I have here tonight, although uh, I guess three weeks later. Um, yeah, so the objective uh, generally seems pretty straightforward, 
But it, it has actually taken uh, decades of systematic testing and cross-pollination to find the compatible uh, pairs of plants. Um, and the blueberry by cranberry hybrid population that I'll be talking about near the end of the presentation is the product of finding two of these compatible parents. So with that said, um, I, I want to accomplish three things with this talk. Uh, one, I want to introduce the group of plants that contain blueberry and cranberry called genus Vaccinium. And I'll, co I'll cover a brief history of blueberry and cranberry crop improvement. Uh, then we'll also explore uh, why we would want to breed a blueberry and a cranberry to begin with. Some people might say they're fine as they are. Um, but for that, if, you know, like I said, I invite you to take a Dixie cup uh, with some berries in it and, um, and then we can go through a tasting exercise. And then we'll also cover the last 30 years of, of interspecific hybridization attempts. And then lastly, I'll show you some of the measurements that I've gathered uh, on the population of blueberry by cranberry hybrids that I, that I work with. And like I said in the announcement, uh, I will be picking some random people to try a hybrid berry here tonight. Um, and so that'll be at the end of the presentation. So yeah, let's just uh, get started here. Um, as I mentioned previously, blueberry and cranberry are both plants within the group of plants called genus Vaccinium. And the commercial blueberry that you buy at the store is, goes by the common name highbush blueberry, and it has the Linnaean name of Vaccinium corymbosum. And the commercial cranberry goes by the common name American cranberry, and its Linnaean name is Vaccinium macrocarpon. Um, this genus is very special to us because it's a group of plants native to North America with distribution um, along the East Coast and in the northern regions of the continent. Uh, this is very different, for example, than tomatoes or apples, which originate elsewhere in the world. For example, tomatoes uh, are originally from the Andean region of South America. And as much as we associate tomato sauce with Italy, tomatoes were not part of Italian cuisine until the Colombian exchange in the 16th century. Uh, similarly, apples were originally from Central Asia, east of the Caspian Sea. And in fact, there was once a medieval settlement near the capital of Kazakhstan uh, called uh, Almatau, which means Apple Mountain. B but cranberry and uh, blueberry have their centers of origin in the northeast of the USA. Uh, this allows us to directly observe these plants in their natural population, in, the, in their natural habitats, and select from the original gene pools with minimal geographical and political constraints. So to talk about um, vaccinium and the earliest indications that we could potentially breed between them, uh, we can start by talking about Canadian botanist Sam Peter van der uh, He and his family immigrated to Canada from the Netherlands in 1947, and he would eventually become professor at Acadia University in Nova Scotia and one of the top authorities in blueberry classification. And if you, if one of the really famous books that he wrote called The Genus Vaccinium in North America, uh, in reading that book, you, you start to realize that he was very frustrated with blueberry classification at the time that he finished his graduate degree in 1972. Uh, in, a pref in the preface of this book, The Genus Vaccinium in North America, he, he noticed that twigs from single colonies of lowbush blueberries, both in New York and Ontario, when fully exposed to sunlight, were sometimes referable as Vaccinium Britanni, when partially shaded as Vaccinium angustifolium, and when completely in the shade as Vaccinium lamarcki. This is patent nonsense, he said. Any existing classification that gives such ambiguous answers brings taxonomy into disrepute. So what he's trying to say with this is that he believed that the system at the time was a source of many misidentifications in the, in the genus. And so for this reason, he went out uh, to document uh, many blueberry uh, and cranberry vaccinium species across the, the continent and extensively surveying natural populations. Uh, he, con he collected continuous characters. So what do we mean by continuous characters? They're traits such as corolla width and length, um, which captures the shape of the flower, the crown, and the petals. Uh, anther lengths, which um, the anther is the, or the flower organ that produces the pollen and as well as the diameter of the pollen itself, which if, if you can believe, varies across the different species. Um, 
And so he did this for 184 uh, vaccinium populations in North America between 1969 and 1981. And he also collected soil samples and took notes of the habitats. So, th I mean, with that much experience, it, it, it makes sense why he became an authority in the field. Um, and so based on the distribution of the vaccinium populations and and the soil that he was gathering, he, propor he proposed an origin story for the genus uh, Vaccinium, which, is, which was in some agreement with his predecessor, uh, a really important um, botanist called Wendell Holmes Camp. And so the hypothesis involves the last glaciation period of the Quaternary, which is also called the Pleistocene glaciation. And many of you are familiar with this concept because of, the glaci of, of how glaciation forged the terrain here in Wisconsin. So from studying ice cores, geologists have described this period of Earth's history as having glacial and interglacial periods, as you can see up there, where the ice would nucleate or start uh, from the American Cordillera and then proceed towards the 38th parallel. Um, and that's, a, that's a, a line of um, longitude. And so during interglacial periods, uh, the ice would uh, go back towards the mountain range, and then during glacial periods, it would advance again. And this happened several times, and each time the ice sheet advanced, it displaced many plant populations east and south, and also flattened much of the land, uh, which is what you see across Wisconsin. And so the interglacial periods might have been responsible for promoting the evolution of proto-vaccinium populations. Um, it's, a very, it's, it's a complicated story to tell, uh, but I just wanted to give you a sense for the natural selection that took place uh, by the time that Van der Kloet and Camp and other botanists surveyed North America for these uh, populations. Uh, I should also mention that vaccinium populations do exist as far south as the Andes in South America and on islands across the world. And this can be explained by migrations that occurred much earlier in Earth's history uh, where there were land masses that are, are you know, non-existent today, but that's beyond the scope of, of this talk uh, this evening. So ultimately, what I want to get at, uh, what is relevant to us tonight, is that uh, Van der Kloet and Camp, they found uh, naturally occurring hybrid populations uh, in their surveys. And so here I'm showing a couple of independent examples of hybrid zones described by uh, these botanists along, you know, uh, uh, Florida and New York, and um, the hybrid zone is a region where two distinct plant populations um, can cross-pollinate, generate hybrid seed, and have that population take over a region of the geography. And so, the two plant populations need to be. Uh, something we call sympatric, so they have to flower at the same time and they have to have a pollinator that they share for the cross-pollination to occur. Um, and so vaccinium hybrids are still found naturally today, and, and there's a recent example in the San Bruno Mountains uh, in California there up top. Um, so given, given what Van der Kloet, Camp, and others did, you know, we have we had a, a better understanding of how we organize vaccinium plants today. Um, we have the main genus vaccinium, and then it's further subdivided in, into subgenera called uh, sections. And when Van der Kloet and, and Camp were doing uh, these surveys, they only, they only had morphology to work with. Um, and now, you know, all of us know we have DNA technology um, to help clarify the relationships between different plants. And so the most comprehensive work that was done on this front was by a professor called um, uh, Kathleen Cron. And right before I get to that, this is, this, these are the kind of maps that Van der Kloet and Camp could put together given the distribution, where they found the plants, and then the morphology uh, that they shared between them. But again, you know, this is not complete uh, given that we have DNA information today. And so Kathleen uh, did a lot of this work as a professor of biology and molecular systematics at Wake Forest University. And she spent her whole career studying a larger family of plants called the Ericaceae, which contain the lineages that gave rise to vaccinium. And so at, you can see the plants that she surveyed um, shaded on the world map, and then these more sort of refined relationships that 
um, that she was able to decipher with DNA. Uh, so returning to that diagram then, because with van der Kloet, Camp, and Cron, now we have a better idea of how the genus is, is um, subdivided. Um, these hybrid zones that Camp and, and uh, van der Kloet described were between members of the section cyanococcus. And so cyano means blue and caucus means sphere. So you can tell, you can already infer what that means. It's all the blueberries that you see naturally and at the store. And so you might be, at the time, this was, this was the best example that we had of being able to cross between species in the same section. And, and it's, and it's the, the reason why we have blueberry uh, in store shelves today. Um, and so I'm gonna go over a little bit of the improvements of, that were done to blueberry, quick history. Um, and we have to start in 1908 with uh, Frederick Covell and Elizabeth White, uh, who was a, a cranberry, uh, the daughter of a cranberry grower in New Lisbon, New Jersey. And Frederick Covell was a USDA botanist. And up until 1908, you could only harvest blueberries from the wild because people, farmers didn't know how to uh, culture them in, in garden soil. And so in his, 19, in his book, in from 1910 called Experiments in Blueberry Culture, Coville describes the experiments that he performed to ultimately discover that blueberry, that blueberry plants need acidic peat that is not overwatered to grow successfully. And so peat is a compost of leaves and wood and moss that can be found in bogs and uh, surfaces of pine woods. And so Elizabeth uh, White read the book uh, and was very excited about the opportunity of growing blueberries commercially because they, they weren't doing that at the time. And so she offered Coville the use of her land in New Jersey as well uh, that was ideally suited for blueberry growing because that's where blueberries came from and her labor force uh, to begin the first breeding efforts to increase the berry size. Uh, to provide a breeding example, um, uh, Dr. Coville brought um, a wild selection that he had from a neighbor called Brooks, and he, he crossed it with a wild selection that, uh, that White made near her, her farm um, called Sui. And then they would cross them and then evaluate the size of the berries, take really careful notes. And Elizabeth White continued breeding uh, way after the partnership uh, between Coville ended. And so I just want to clarify a point here with wild selection, what I mean by uh, a wild selection. Um, and so, I guess I'll, yes, here we go. Um, yeah. So wild selection is simply a, a plant chosen from a naturally occurring population. So here's a, a little short video of wild cranberries growing near a lake at the Kemp uh, Natural Resources Station near Monaco, Wisconsin. And if you wanted to make a wild selection of these cranberry plants, uh, you would go grab some vines and propagate them uh, uh, based on some thing that you observed, like better berries or, um, you know, uh, vigorous growth. So that being said, cranberry culture was mainly based in wild selections until the initial cranberry improvement cycles um, were that were undertaken as a response to uh, false blossom in 1929. That's very different than blueberry, because in blueberry they wanted to increase the size, but in cranberry there was a disease that took over. Um, so, uh, and when false blossom uh, emerged, um, it threatened the cranberry industry because it, 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 was a, it didn't have a cure. So false blossom is caused by a bacteria that is carried by um, an insect called the leafhopper, um, in particular the blunt nose leafhopper, and it transmits a bacteria that prevents the f cranberry flower from assuming its down formation. You can see how it kind of has the, the cranberry, a healthy cranberry uh, inflorescence will have like a crane formation, and when it's diseased, it won't be able to assume that formation, and therefore the, the, the fruit can't, um, develop properly. And so, uh, so the two research, researchers um, that, that uh, you know, wanted to uh, find a solution to this problem uh, were 
uh, R.B. Wilcox and USDA entomologist Charles S. Beckwith, because at the time, the industry by 1929 had already uh, advanced beyond Massachusetts and New Jersey into uh, Wisconsin. Um, and so if you have a disease that's out there that, can, that has no cure, it can potentially decimate the local economies uh, and people's livelihoods. Um, so what they were able to figure out, uh, Wilcox and Beckwith, was that some of the uh, wild selections that were actively grown in Massachusetts called McFarland and Early Black were the most resistant to this disease. And in, in, in a future improvement cycle and between 1934 and 1950, uh, the cultivar Stevens was shown to be the most resistant, um, which came from a, a, a cross between two wild selections, one from Massachusetts and one from Wisconsin. Um, so I want to note that even even though Coville, White, Wilcox, and Beckwith were very successful in, in their improvement efforts, they were still, those improvements were largely regionalized to a certain extent uh, because even though blueberries could be cultured, they still required, um, a, um, they were still required cold temperatures to break out of dormancy because we know that, well now we know that as fall approaches and day lengths shorten, less light is available for plant growth. And so for this reason, the plants enter dormancy to slow their growth, strengthen their roots, and conserve energy. Uh, so the prolonged exposure to cold temperature is important for breaking out of dormancy because it begins the process of releasing sugar stored in starch in the plant cells. And then as winter ends, the, the, the day lengths increase, uh, and then the plants can use this starch to promote their growth in spring. So at the, at the time, uh, now we know this, but at the time, uh, uh, during, Co during Coville's improvement cycle for blueberry, people thought that it, if you just put a plant in growth in, um, in the warm, in, in, in a warm temperature, that it would actively grow. And so Coville showed that chilling hours were important for blueberries to exit the dormancy. So then how did we go to bring it all back to interspecific hybridization? Um, how did we go from a regional crop like a blueberry that only grew in the Northeast uh, to now what is the global production of blueberry. And that actually was through the interspecific hybridization of, of uh, highbush blueberry with the evergreen blueberry. So these are two plants in the same section and the evergreen blueberry up top uh, had, had been selected naturally by the temperatures in Florida. These are, this is a Florida native. Uh, and so if you could cross the, pl the, the blueberry that, ha that has a higher requirement for chilling hours with a blueberry that has a lower requirement for chilling hours, then you could have progeny that you can select from that have lower uh, chilling requirements. Um, and so that's, that's essentially the answer. That's how, so that interspecific hybridization between two different species in the same section uh, led to what is now global production of, of blueberry. Um, right, so seeing the, the so s breeders seeing that interspecific hybridization was possible within a section. So just to clarify, we have different species in a section, and then they're, they're able to cross amongst each other, right? Uh, but the genus has so many sections, so much variation. So pl plant breeders. Uh, really wanted to know if they could, you know, cross between sections uh, to be able to harness the speciation across the entire genus. Um, and so why would they want to do this? Like, like, I, like I, I posed the question earlier, uh, blueberry is probably fine, a cranberry is probably fine. But if you look across the whole genus, you can potentially uh, unlock a, a lot of variation and customize uh, different berries for different climates, uh, which would be really helpful for, you know, for nutrition and berry enthusiasts, if if there are any out there. Um, right. So now I've been talking for a few minutes, um, and I wanted us I wanted us to explore the 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 tasting. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have berries or have you eaten them yet. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a couple here. 
and I want us to um, try a cranberry just first on its own. <laughs> it doesn't get any easier. <laughs> and can I, can I get some responses, some one word responses about what people tart. are, yeah, tart. very tart. Uh, yes, they're all the same, yes. Anything else? Yeah, crunchy, that's a good one, yeah. Um, right, so I think that's, so you can kind of see why we would want to improve, make improvements by hybridizing with other species. Um, so let's just try a blueberry to, uh, you know, clean the palate, exactly. <laughs> And so what do you what do you what are you tasting here? Sweet. Yeah. Can you, can you repeat the responses? Yeah, so sweet, somebody said sweet. Um, mushy. Mushy? True. True. Juicy. What was that? More chewable. Yeah, more chewable, absolutely. Juicy. Juicy, yeah. Yummy. Yummy. <laughs> yeah. The, that's exactly the point. So now let's just like eat them both together and see what maybe potentially how if you took genes from both of them could you improve the experience here? Yeah, I didn't grimace that time. Okay, well thank you for participating. Um, I'm glad. No, I, I'm interested. I'm curious that nobody brought up um, the skin of both fruits. Uh, the formal term is a cuticle, uh, and that's the barrier, be the barrier between the interior flesh and um, the outside world. And there's this waxy layer called, um, yeah, there's a, there's a layer of wax and, and some biological polyester called cutin. And so you might have noticed that after buying blueberries at the store and leaving them in the refrigerator for a little bit, they start to shrivel. And so um, you might you might conceive that a blueberry could be improved by taking the, the cuticle of a cranberry, which um, doesn't really lose water. You can keep them for, for weeks, and they'll still be as firm and tart and sour. Um, but, a, but a blueberry doesn't do that, right? Um, and so that could be an improvement made to blueberry, right? You, you, you improve the cuticle, and you extend shelf life. Um, and then... <coughs> We don't have to go very far in terms of um, the cranberry. It's tart, it's very sour, and the, the sugar in a blueberry could really improve um, the taste for the fresh market because most of us are familiar with cranberry through our cultural experience of Thanksgiving and a sauce, but that has a lot of sugar. So uh, for the fresh market, there, there can be an improvement. Right, so let's see. Yeah, so these are the combinations that I was referring to when I, when I was talking about unlocking the, the potential across the, the, the genus, right, between all the sections. If we could figure out a way to cross between them, uh, then, then we can customize berries for different regions of the world, different palettes, et cetera. Um, great. So I'm going to go through a little bit of the history of of the, the scientists and the breeders that have tried to accomplish this goal over the last uh, 30 years. Um, so Sylvia Brooks and Paul Irene in 1996 had similar ideas here. Um, so they wanted to take the Vaccinium arboreum, which is called a sparkleberry, and they wanted to cross it with highbush blueberry because the sparkleberry has a, a larger growing region than Vaccinium uh, corymbosum, the blueberry. So you could potentially you know, ex expand growth and commerce to different areas. And so they, 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 they did some interesting findings here because they realized that they couldn't take a blueberry and a sparkleberry and cross them directly together. They had to go through an intermediary uh, called Vaccinium darawi. And so this was called the evergreen blueberry. This is the one that, um, that was used to imp imp that lower the chilling requirements for vaccine and corymbosum. So this, this plant is very interesting. And so they, they, they took an intermediate hybrid between vaccinium darawi and arboreum, and then they were able to cross to highbush blueberry. 
So what was interesting about that um, is that they, they figured out two things. They figured out that they could cross between sections, in this case, section cyanococcus, which has all the blue spheres, all the blue berries, and section abatodendron, which is where the sparkle berry uh, is organized. Um, and then secondly, that you, maybe you do, you do need to have one hybridization before your target uh, to, to have um, genetic exchange that you want. Then in 1997, um, Zeldin and McCown here at UW, they, they crossed, an, they, they used a very interesting plant called um, Vaccinium reticulatum, or, or the Ohalo eye berry from Hawaii. It grows on volcanic soils uh, on the islands. And they, they, they figured out some interesting things here because um, they were able to cross directly between Ohalo eye and cranberry, and then ohalo eye and lingonberry. Lingonberry is, um, is very uh, famous in, in Swedish uh, cuisine as um, in jams and all that. Uh, so they were, they were able to cross when Vaccinium reticulatum was used as a mother. So they could only really put pollen from a cranberry or pollen from a lingonberry onto uh, an ohalo eye flower, but not the other way around. So this shows you that there is some unidirectionality in, in some of the crosses. And so that, that in itself is interesting. Uh, but now, before I continue on with the history, I, I kind of want to go through some of the mechanics of how you would even hybridize. So I'm talking about crossing these two, these two plants together right, to uh, potentiate all the variation across the, the, the genus. But how would you do that? So here I'm showing uh, that, you know, all flowers have a, a, a stigma and a style where they receive pollen from, from a, a different, uh, from either the same species or another species. And so when flowers are ready to uh, accept pollen, they usually have this little, um, this uh, exudate um, that will hydrate the pollen and, and begin the process of fertilization. So what do I mean by hydrating pollen? So here on the left, uh, I have dry pollen from Vaccinium macrocarpon or, or, the, or the American cranberry, the, ver the variety Stevens. And then when, when, it, it, it has, when it's exposed to this exudate at the tip of the stigma of a flower, it will then expand. Uh, and this begins the process of the pollen uh, sending down their uh, their, gen their, their genes. And so here I'm showing a pollen tube that emerges from the aperture of a pollen grain of Vaccinium crassifolium. And, it, and at the tip of this pollen tube, you can see on the right, uh, in, the, in the, little, um, the little red pollen tube at the tip are the nuclei that belong to, um, that are the genetic material of the male in the cross. And so this is, this is really genetic transport. And so then as the pollen tube, as the, the pollen is hydrated at the tip of the stigma and, and, pollen form, and pollen tube elongation commences, it goes down the style of the flower uh, towards fertilization. So here you can actually see, uh, I cut a little window in a style and, and, um, and stained it so you can actually see the pollen tubes like up top, but actually in the flower organ. And if that wasn't clear, the style is that, that, that little organ that's protruding, for example, from this flower of Vaccinium macrocarpon. And then the pollen tube and the genetic information is traveling down towards the ovules, which eventually become the seeds. Um, and so that's what I mean by fertilization. So that's, that's what you would do in, a, in an interspecific cross, is you would take the pollen from one plant, and then you would take the flower of the other, and then put the pollen on the flower, and then hope that um, the genetic, the, the, pollen, the pollen elongates, goes down to the ovules, and eventually gives you a seed. And that seed is gonna be the hybrid, potentially hybrid plant that you would grow up, like you see here. So I'm gonna kind of go through this a, um, a little more briefly here. There are some really important uh, um, advances here that kind of still, uh, suggested the same thing. For example, here Nikolai Vorsa and, um, and Jessica Chikolesi Johnson, they figured out that, again, you do need an intermediate. So in order to, for you to cross Darrow I 
um, with the evergreen blueberry with um, macrocarpon, you need an intermediate. You need an intermediary hybrid uh, be, with oxycoccus, which is a small cranberry. And then Mark Elenfeld and uh, Jim Polishock, they they were able to uh, figure out that somehow, if you were to find vaccinium species that are very distant on remote islands, like like for example, like the Ohalo eyeberry. Uh, in this case, you have vaccinium patifolium, which is on um, on it's on an island off the coast of Portugal, um, and and they can mediate uh, hybridization as well. And I, but I do want to bring up uh, one person here is Paul Irene. So you can see here that from 1996 with Sylvia Brooks, um, uh, all the way until 2018, he's been trying different hybridizations. And so it takes an entire career of testing uh, different. Uh, different combinations to get the populations. And in this case, Paul Irene always, he was, uh, he was doing crosses in, in a very classical way. So here he was looking, he was taking highbush blueberry, which is again the one that we eat, and he was crossing it to deerberry, which is the, the, the picture I have there with vaccinium staminium, and he was generating a first generation hybrid that he would then use to uh, the pollen from to to back cross to uh, the high bush blueberry. And this is how you get a little bit of genetic exchange, but you mainly maintain the identity of, of the plant that you want, which is a, a high bush blueberry here. Madeira was the Portuguese Yes, yes, exactly. And so it, it, it takes a long time, right? And so it, now, you know, in the present, um, this is the, the real development now um, that is the core of my, of my um, my graduate studies here, uh, and it's here in 2017, uh, Mark Elenfeld and uh, uh, Jim Ballington would find a plant that, for reasons that, we're that are still unclear, would be able to cross to both highbush blueberry, lingonberry, and, uh, and cranberry, which are all the commercial species. So this is exactly what we've been looking for, a plant that could be a mediator for genetic exchange across the entire genus. And so I just wanted to point out this plant here. It's called the Andean blueberry, or Vaccinium meridionale. And so you find it in, in the mountains of uh, Antioquia uh, in Colombia. And people call it there in Spanish, they call it agras, or mortinho. And it's found in, you know, in the Colombian cordillera, or basically the, the Colombian part of the Andes. And you can see there that, um, what the plant looks like. And so for a long time, it was, this plant was basically um, harvested from the wild. Um, and so I wanted to just to put a human element to this. You know, a, a lot of the uh, local uh, people there didn't really, um, they would just use it to eat and not really uh, realize um, that that it was that it could actually have this implication in, in science, and so uh, it's very interesting. The only thing I wanted to point out here is that um, now they're they're going through the process of commercialization in the same way that Elizabeth White and James uh, and Frederick Coville did in the 1910s, where they found, they were creating markets for uh, different berries, and that's how you know now with with the right markets, they're able to then. Uh, uh, fund their breeding programs and actually make it uh, uh, something that's cultivated on a farm rather than just it being wild and for uh, personal harvesting. And so uh, Mark Elenfeld um, and Jim Ballington, yeah, they were able, the first thing that they, they, they figured out is that Andean, the Andean blueberry can generate many hybrids. So generally speaking, um, in previous attempts throughout the years there, you can see that um, the frequency of getting a hybrid by an interspecific cross was very, is very low. I mean, four hybrids in 3,300 crosses. I mean, that, that, those are pretty slim odds there. Um, and so with Vaccinium meridionale, they were able to get way better odds, 190 out of 1,900. And so why is this important, right? Um, and I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit, but Basically, the the odds just to just to make drive this home this point home. The odds now between 
uh, across or the frequency of generating hybrids between vaccinium marinelli and macrocarpon now is 500 F1 hybrids per 30 pollinations. That's something that you can do in five minutes. And so why would we want so many hybrids? And, and the, here the idea is that for a hybrid to be successful, you need a large starting population. Why? Because you need all the genetic combinations. You, you want to you wanna, uh, generate enough genetic combinations that can display the full array of all the, the characteristics that you want to see, so then you can select the ones that are going to be the best. And not only that, but you also need the plant to be um, self-fertile. Uh, so you need it to produce fruit, and, and you need the fruit to have seed, so that you can advance the, 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 the hybrid populations into a second and a third generation. Um, right, and so now this part of the presentation, I'm going to start talking about uh, this F1 hybrid that, that I'm studying here, uh, thanks to plants that Mark Elenfeld has sent over from New Jersey. And the, basically, it's Vaccinium marinelli by Vaccinium macrocarpon as an F1 hybrid. And something you can see that's quite odd is that the berries don't quite look like the mom or the dad. They don't look like the, the cranberry or the blueberry, right? It's kind of in the middle. Um, yes, so now I'm going to go into the metrics, like I said. So what, what am I seeing? What are we seeing here with all the hybrids that are being generated between this cross? And so they all come in different sizes. And after about two, three years of growth, the sizes have been consistent. So there are some seeds that are going to be generated that are never going to produce a big plant. And then there are, there's some seed that is going to produce a big plant. Um, and that's exactly, exactly what I meant by large population, because then we get all the genetic combinations for selection. Furthermore, you know, not all the F1 hybrids are flowering. So that is one of the things um, that those are one of the requirements for being able to select a good hybrid. You need the hybrid to to have fruit so that you can so that you can take the seed and continue advancing the hybrid population. And then lastly, you know, not all the F1 hybrids produce fruit. But the good thing is that because we started with a large population, we have about, right now we're hosting 200 or so plants here of these F1s from the original 500 that were generated from the 30 pollinations. And I think it's like 40% of them are flowering. But it had, had, we, had the cross only generated a small amount of hybrids, you would have less plants that are, that are, that are flowering. So the, the point is that, that this is exactly why you want large populations. Um, and then the, 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 the curious thing here, uh, and the reason why we're going to continue advancing the population is because not all the F1 hybrids are producing the same fruit. So uh, some of the plants will only produce cranberry-like fruit, and then some of them only the blueberry-like fruit, uh, and then some plants produce a mixture, and I'm not exactly sure uh, why that is. But, the, but what you can appreciate here is that the internal flesh is very different. So in the ones that look more like blueberry, you have a red sort of flesh um, with potentially a softer cuticle, a softer sort of waxy or less waxy skin versus the ones that are red that have, um, that are more cranberry-like. But, but then I'm comparing it next to a cranberry fruit. And I want to make a point here because you, you notice that the, a cranberry Fruit, generally speaking, has holes in it. I don't know if you got a chance when you were grimacing after eating one of these, but um, but yeah, if you, I'm not gonna, oh. yeah, um, you can see that it has holes in it, right? And so as we continue selecting, um, we're gonna have to take this into account because it actually plays a really important role. Uh, we don't want to disturb agronomic practices, harv um, harvesting. Practices and so many of you are familiar with this uh, with this image here. Um, as I mentioned before, you know a lot of um, cranberry beds they start off as like single plants on on the bottom of es of a es uh, of a pool like excavation that has sand on it. And after flower after the flowers bloom and the fruit matures, then they flood the bed, and then the 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 berries will then float. Right and and um, but the holes do contribute to flotation, but.
but also the fruit density. It's the same reason why apples float, but they don't have holes. Um, and so in, my, in, in our selection screening, we're noticing here, I'm playing a couple of videos of just dropping the berries. So that's a, one of the purple berries that the hybrid produces. And the flotation is a, a, a little a less uh, fast coming back up. But then some of the, the, the red berries, they float just as well, even if they don't have holes. So this is one of the things where we don't want to disturb the industry. And so we have to consider um, that we want to improve flavor, but we also don't want to affect the, the density of, of, the, of, of the berry. Something else we do is we test the uh, different levels of firmness. Um, and so here we have this machine. I, I tried to be as still as I could, but basically it's a machine that will press the berry and it will generate these curves um, that will give you uh, the maximum compression force. And so basically that kind of tells you how, how, how well does the berry compress, right? And so if it's softer like a blueberry, you know, the, the, the curve is gonna be lower as you can see down, uh, all the blueberry curves are really low, right? And cranberry as expected is, ver is a very firm, very uh, crunchy berry, right? But what, what's great is that the F1 hybrids are producing variation that we can select because some of them are softer, some of them are firmer. And so that's what we want. Um, and that's why we're, we're so interested in this cross. And then lastly, um, the F1 hybrids uh, show vigor for seed potential. So remember what, what we had talked about was that you need a large starting population and you need the flowering plants to produce seed. So here, what I, um, what I did is I dissected out the ovules from different flowers. And so I had mentioned that the ovules are where the pollen tube will finally do the fertilization and then those ovules will become seed. So if you open up the flower and count how many ovules, you can get an idea of potentially how many seed it's gonna produce. And so what you can see here, I, took the, I compared the two parents versus the F1 hybrids and you can see something that we call hybrid vigor. And so that's when there's enough, uh, there's enough, um, there, there's enough divergent genetics that the F1 hybrid will be greater than the sum of its parents. That's sort of like the, the easiest way to, uh, to understand it. And lastly, and this is, this is the part where I wanna go back to the cuticle uh, example that I had talked about. So I wanted to um, test if my idea for uh, improving the shelf stability of a blueberry could be possible, right? So with the F1 hybrid, so we know, like I had mentioned, that a blueberry, here I left a few, uh, some blueberries out at room temperature. And you can see that in six days they're kind of shriveled, but a cranberry keeps very well, right? And so we have variation in the F1 that we can select. And so I wanted to know if exposure to just room temperature and having it dehydrate, if the cuticle, which I can see here, the blueberry-like one has less of a waxier cuticle than the cranberry one, if that has an effect on the loss of water or basically dehydration, right? So. I, I was able, at the time, I didn't have the F1 hybrid uh, berries, but I did have this plant here. And so I'm gonna introduce, um, I haven't, um, I wish I had a name, but um, <laughs> I'm gonna introduce this plant here. But it's, it's basically, it's a, it's a very similar plant to, the, to the, uh, the original Andean blueberry by Cranberry, only this one's a little further along. So the ones that I work with are the F1s, uh, that were generated by Mark Elenfell in New Jersey. And then this plant here is the second generation hybrid. So it's a little further advanced. It's, it's been selected. Um, and yeah, so the seed from the hybrid fruit was germinated and it gave us this plant. Uh, and so what you can see here is I took some cranberries, I took some two types of blueberries and I took the hybrid berry uh, and I just left them out. And you can see here that cranberry hardly loses any water. I mean, at room temperature. Uh, and the blueberries just plummet, right? Uh, because they shrivel. But the F2 hybrid, on average, um, doesn't lose as water as quickly. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, 
it, you can see that physically uh, in, in the berry, right? And so I, I did a very, um, th there's some indication that this is also an effect that is seen in the, in the hybrid fruit itself, uh, in the F1 that I'm working with. I didn't have a large sample size, but basically I took some of the red berries and I compared them to some of the purple berries, right, versus cranberry. It's not, a, this isn't a great test because I didn't have a lot of fruit at the time. But you can see here is that the rate of dehydration is higher for a blueberry for the, blue, the blueberry-like F1 hybrid than the cranberry-like F1 hybrid. So in order to, so I, I felt like that was, I'll, I'll, I'll be running more tests, but essentially th there's, there's promise here to kind of improve the shelf stability of, of a berry that's a little sweeter. Uh, we are working with a, with a USDA um, food scientist right now to actually describe um, quantitatively the the flavor of the berry um, but there there's a lot there's there's a lot more to do but I think I think this is kind of a proof of concept that you can you can increase the shelf stability uh, by using more of a, a of a red phenotype selecting for a blueberry that or a berry that's sweeter but that has more cuticle to maintain its shelf life so yeah, that's it. And and like as promised, you know, I just wanted to have one person randomly come up and then pick a berry, and then now you've tried a blueberry, now you've tried a cranberry, and this is very similar. The lingonberry is very similar to the cranberry. It's just a little smaller. The flavor is a little bit more complex, but um, this is kind of what you could expect from an improved variety. So I wanted to have somebody <coughs> randomly come up any volunteers, just to the pick one out and then tell me. Right here, both of you. Yes. Do you have any tips for picking a right berry here? No, let's see, let's pick them on this side though so the audience, so that people can see. Pick the face of the strawberry. Yes, and then just. Look for something that that you think might taste good. The redder, the better. Okay. <laughs> That's probably as much as I can say. So you've tried the cranberry, you tried the blueberry, right? Yes. Okay. They look okay. Like so ha we'll, we'll have we'll have you go first, and then I want you to I want to, I want you to describe the taste to the audience here. Oh, that's good. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> that's good. It's like similar to the cranberry, kind of in like the firmness of it. Like it has like that kind of waxy skin, mm -hmm. a little bit tougher, but yeah. it's not as tart. Like it's, it's sweeter. Great. Okay, we'll have our second participant here. <laughs> it's definitely a lot sweeter than just the plain cranberry. Uh, you can definitely taste like the sour aspect that comes through, but it's like, it's countered really well by the sweetness. And then as you said, the cuticle is definitely a little tougher, but it's nowhere near as tough as the, as the cuticle of the cranberry. There you go. Well, <laughs> you heard it here first, I guess. All right, thank you. All right, you can have one more and go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, you know, I'll, I'll, so that's, that's essentially it. I just want to, before, before I, I wrap this up, I just want to you know, thank some important people. Um, these are all my advisors here, Anna Edlin, who has been really helpful in, 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 in um, showing me all the techniques for imaging the pollen that, I, that you saw so that I could communicate effectively how the fertilization happens. And of course, Mark Elenfeld, who's a, a research geneticist, a blueberry breeder in uh, in New Jersey, um, in Chatsworth, New Jersey, and and of course my my advisor here on campus, uh, Juan Zalapa, who is a research genetist as well, a cranberry breeder um, with USDA ARS as well. And you can you can you can see that this this project is is complex, so it, it, it's unique. So it needs un unique fields to be explained uh, uh, and and to be able to you know hopefully someday potentially be able to cross across all the sections and, and get, you know, interesting tasting berries uh, to, you know, to, so that people can enjoy them. 
Uh, and then lastly, you know, I have a small team here. At my one of my undergrad mentees, Jordan Car uh, Cargill. Uh, Eric Wiesman is our uh, uh, he's a research technician as well uh, with USA ARS, but. Uh, secretly, he's our lab manager, so he really helps with logistics, and, and we're really grateful. And then my, and then our technician, uh, Yvonne Hernandez, uh, who uh, works with us as well. And so that'll be it. Uh, I'll take any questions now. Yeah, I'm wondering if you're familiar with a type of blueberry that's reddish in color. I've seen it in commercial seed catalogs. It's called the pink, lemonary, pink lemonade blueberry. I don't know the scientific name. I'm wondering if you would know anything about its origin. Then I was also going to ask you about, uh, are you familiar at all with the work or the breeding or whatever that's taken place to create larger sizes of blueberries? I know there's some species of blueberries now that are almost the size of grapes. Wondering if you'd know anything about that. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, the gentleman was asking about, um, about the pink lemonade, pink lemonade variety of blueberry. Um, which that yeah um, I yeah so that's that's a, that was a selection I, I believe of of blueberry if I'm not mistaken and so the idea is that you know they do these like they do these crosses between between um, two parents that have traits like maybe maybe they found um, I'm not I'm not exactly sure like the specific lineage but the idea generally in plant breeding is that you take a parent that has a trait that you want and, and then you take another one that you know maybe has a bigger size so you take a, one one plant that has a big size berries and one that has like lighter color and so you cross those and then you're going to find in the ver in, in the in the generation in the following generation you're going to select for a plant that has both and so I'm not exactly sure what the lineage of the pink lemonade one is, but it's, it's definitely not crossed with, with the lemon or anything. It's just, it's just a blueberry, and, and, and they, they, they selected for color in that case, because it, you know, maybe, maybe they found a market class for it. They said, oh, well, there's, there's a market for a, a pink thing, a pink berry, you know, and so that's kind of how, how these things go. It has yes. no cranberry in it. No, it has no cranberry in it, no. We have a question on Zoom. Sure. Okay. In the new cranberry crosses, have you seen variations in dormancy chill requirements? Is there a risk to current cranberry industry if the climate growing zone is greatly expanded? Um, so the, the so changes in, in, the question was changes in dormancy. Have I seen any? Um, Right now, we're treating all the plants as if they were a cranberry. So what what we have is um, we you know all of these different plants have um, all these different plants have um, certain amount of chilling hour requirements. So because we know that it has cranberry genetics in it, we kind of treat it like a cranberry. So um, what I have done is I do observe when they start flowering. So some of them flower a little earlier than others, and um, that's interesting, sure. As for it being a threat to the cranberry industry, I think right now it wouldn't be um, because a lot of production, and my understanding is a lot of cranberry production right now is, is for processing cranberry, so into sauce, into craisins, and those priorities are a, a, a little different. What, what, there is very little footprint in terms of um, fresh market because it, it's, you know, people will, people will buy them to make their own sauce, but you're not, you're probably not buying them, you know, in February, like I just, or, or you know, or in, you know what I'm saying? It's like you're not buying them off season as much. Um, so really, what I hope to do, what we hope to do, is to make varieties that um, that that can expand the market, but for the for the fresh eating, and so that really wouldn't impact. At least, you know, that's my perspective. But 
I, I, I would have to talk to more breeder, more uh, cranberry industry leaders to know. You say you've been working with the F1 hybrids. Have you gone any further to F2s, F3s for developing some standardization? and particularly of the mixed berry types? So great question. So have I, have I gone beyond F1? And so I have germinated a few seeds of the F1 because they are viable, um, but uh, the situation is that um, these are perennial plants, so they actually take a quite, a, quite some time to get going. It just so happened that uh, Mark Elenfeld in New Jersey, you know, one of our collaborators, he had already advanced this population years, um, for, 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 for several years before, before the, the F1s of the, of the blueberry by cranberry. So that's, this is why I wanted to show this plant as sort of a proxy for what we can expect when those F2s, which I don't, you know, we don't have very many, but um, because, at, because at these F, the F1s, the blueberry cranberry F1s are only three years old. So to get a plant to go into full production and be able to get a, a lots and lots of seed, you need about four years. So, and that's part of the reason why my test for the rate of decline for dehydration was, was underpowered, uh, because I just don't have that much fruit right now. Uh, but the plants are growing, and uh, last year it was the best year yet. So it, it's just gonna get more, it's just gonna get, the plants are gonna get bigger, they're gonna produce more fruit, and then, and then it's gonna take Another three years to actually be able to evaluate those F2s. But, th but that's why I wanted to share this plant here, uh, to, because it's a little bit more advanced. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, just following up with that, um, I know that there's been some work on getting <laughs> flowering to happen, like you can kind of induce flowering like within a year. It's not easy, mm -hmm. but uh, could you do something like single seed selection where you're not really selecting per se um, for particular traits, but you're just trying to advance the generation rapidly and then select downstream? Yeah, I think, I think the, 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 you, you can get it to flower, that's true. And we haven't really explored that. We really wanted just to, the plant to just flower when it's gonna flower which that's why our timeline is usually, between generations, it's about two, two to three years. Um, yeah, they need at least one overwintering, so you need to grow it, and they need to gain a little bit of wood at least one season before they can even try and push any flowers. And then even then, it's just, they're, they're like, you might get one flowering branch that will generate two berries. You know, you need like a big plant like this one here which has already secondary tertiary growth. And the amount of berries that I've gotten, this one flowered twice this year, once in the summer and once right now. And I think we could even get it to flower three times. It's, it's kind of ever bearing. Uh, so we can select for that. That would be something interesting. But yeah, this one here, you know, to advance it to an, a, a fourth generation, that, that's, you know, I think you, it's, you're, it's better to go to wait a little bit, you know. Um, just because the gains you're going to make are are not not as not as big as if you just waited for the plant. But yeah, you're right. We we could do that if we really if it was really really important. I guess. Um, yes, sir. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Have has the have the hybrids or the uh, been uh, anal analyzed from their DNA to find out what actually changes between be, be, between the originals, the, the parents, and the hybrids? Yeah, that's a great question. And so that, that I'm, actually, I'm actually doing that in the next couple of weeks. So what we're, what we're gonna do is we, we take dry leaves uh, from, the, from, the, from the plants, from each plant. So out of all the 200 that we're hosting here in Madison, um, I'm sending all of them to get DNA sequenced. And so based on the different phenotypes that we see just in the F1, some flower, some don't. Some set fruit, some don't. Some are flowering earlier, some are flowering later. All these traits you can just write down and you can correlate that with the genetic information. And then you can try and pinpoint 
what are the genes that are causing the differences, you know? And so a lot of that requires observation. So while I haven't sent out, the genetics aren't changing, the phenotypes are. So I've been very carefully the last couple of years just taking notes on what the phenotypes are. So yeah, certainly when we send that in, we can do, you know, different studies to, to, to pinpoint what the genetics are. Just an add on, how expensive is it these days to do that? A full full DNA analysis on 200 plants, let's say. For, yeah, it varies. Some people, yeah, some, some companies, yeah, it just depends what you want, but right now, uh, I believe you can find a good bid for like $50 a sample, potentially. Uh, and so 200 plants plus the parents, that, you know, it's, it's not outrageous. Yeah, it's not an outrageous amount of money, but then you have to do it in duplicate, potentially. So, it, it, but it's, it's definitely reasonable, you know. That's why I like working with plants. Yeah. Have you done any testing for disease or insect resistance yet? So I've been, I've, we, we work in control. So the question is, uh, have I done any, any um, screening for pests? And I guess the, the short answer is not so much. Um, I, I have noticed that some of them, most hybrids, a lot of hybrids are susceptible to something called powdery mildew. I'm not exactly, we're not exactly sure why, um, but it, you know, the parents will be resistant and they won't be affected by powdery mildew. But sometimes when you do a cross, the progeny somehow have like, I don't know, they're just more susceptible. Maybe they're younger. I'm not exactly sure exactly right now why. But I, I, I do take notes sometimes on the nutrition. So that one of the years I noticed that a lot of my, a lot of my plants were severely affected by micronutrient supplementation, so some of them weren't getting enough. And so you could see chlorosis uh, in the plants, and so I wrote that down. And, and some of them were fine. Like, you know, they were able to, with the acidic peats, they were able to get the nutrients, you know, and not, not really look severely affected, but some of them were more chlorotic, as we say. Any pH difference in the soils between those plants that were chlorotic and the ones that weren't? No, I, we didn't check that. Uh, we do control, we try to control the pH of all, the soil of all our plants because we, uh, we apply acidified water and then we keep peat the same. Yeah, so we test the water. Yeah, so we test the water and we keep it consistent. So that shouldn't really, that shouldn't really affect it. So I think, I think that, that is a genetic response that, that you would then you know, write down to do an analysis like this. Um, would you happen to know uh, anything about the work that has taken place uh, uh, concerning interbreeding between uh, blackberries and raspberries? I know there's been some of that, possibly for similar reasons to uh, cranberries and blueberries, and you see in commercial seed catalogs, again, mm -hmm. some of the results of that, like there's something called a Loganberry, which I think is a cross between a raspberry and a blackberry. Thanks. Yeah, so this is another great example of, of how you can interspecifically hybridize. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what, basically what we were talking about in this presentation was how do we hybridize different species across different sections that have all this variation in this genus? Sometimes they like crossing, sometimes they don't. It just so happens that in the genus Rubus, which is like, you know, raspberries, blackberries, uh, they, they can also interspecifically hybridize. And so you're, you're, you're right, a lot of the crosses between like raspberry and blackberry and, you know, the different types of those type of berries are not related to vaccinium. So Rubus and vaccinium, two different things. But they can also interspecifically hybridize. So I believe, yeah, I think there's like there's several of them. Like the I think the Logan berry is one of them. Yes, yeah. But it's similar concept, but just a different class, a, a different uh, genus of plants, a different group of plants. Right, sure. But you can see the value there. You know, you can see the value is that you could get a different flavor profile, and it's just different. It's just a little harder sometimes in other families like like Vaccinium. So. So even though Wisconsin's been known to drink Angostura bitter since Prohibition, I wonder if you thought of knocking out the bitter gene in the cranberries. Yeah, well, that takes that. Yeah. So the, the question was, um, can can you can you do um, uh, can you use genetic technology, you know, modern genetic technology to um, 
to adjust some of the genetics of the inherent genetics of a cranberry. And that, well, the thing is, it's so in a lot of other systems, uh, plant systems, it can be very easy to um, to change genes. But in this particular, like woody plants, except for probably a, like one tree, which is the poplar tree, the uh, cottonwood tree, uh, most plants that have that are woody don't like to, don't, they don't like their genetics being tweaked that way. So you can try it, and then it just, you know, it won't. Like you have to culture the plant, and it, it's very difficult. So it's, you know, you have to go through a steps of tissue culture and. Yeah, plants, they, they're amenable to it, but not all the time. So I know we have a couple systems for how to do uh, genetic manipulations in cranberry, but, but again, if you just cross between different things, you know, may, if you just cross between the genus, it, it, you avoid the, the research and development that it takes to, to, to specifically target a gene, and instead, you just work with you know, traditional breeding and selection. Breeding and selection, breeding and selection. Even though for perennial plants it takes a little longer, um, with like wheat and you know other other uh, co you know corn is a perfect example that is very fast, um, you know. And, and so instead of you, if you want to explore more in detail the function of genes, um, you know we're in the biotech building. A lot of people definitely do that because they want to know specifics. But sometimes if you just want to improve flavor. Um, you want to know some specifics, but you also just need the plants. Sometimes you just want the plants to select themselves, and you can taste. And it, you know, I think the two things go hand in hand. Uh, but as of right now, we're just kind of going with 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 this. Yeah, that was a great talk. Um, I think the most pressing question here is, what's the name of the cranberry blueberry crossover? Yeah, that, 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 yes. So the, the question was, what am I, what are, what are the names for these with for these plants? And that's actually something that I wanted to ask you to hear tonight. Uh, I couldn't get the poll going, but I wanted to poll all of you to to just the name. They're, they're you know, if if you flag me down either or you just tell me now. Uh, what you think could be a name for this? You know, um, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to um, influence your naming, so I won't, I won't say anything that I've heard some people say. Oh, we can call it this, we can call it that, but please, like, I, I, I really do want to know, because it's ultimately it's the it, it's it's people that are going to eat these, and if, if if you can, you know, imprint on their mind something that's fun and that conveys the flavor experience, then that's great. You know, that's what we want. We, we would want, we want people to, to have, a, have a demand for it. So then, you know, people, then, then farmers grow it. And then the, the demand just kind of, you know, you know, classical economics there. The cran blueberry. <laughs> cran blueberry, cran, cran blueberry. Yeah. <laughs> Vita berry. Vita berry? Vita. Oh, yeah, like life. The berry of life. Oh, Vita <laughs> berry. I like that. I like that. Okay. Well, um. uh, I, the question I had was in reference to, has, have you checked for the nutritional value or, say, antioxidant value of this hybrid beyond the uh, hydration and uh, cuticle? So right now, I'm actually in the process of doing that. So the question was, have I looked at nutritional content? Yeah, so that's why we're working with the US, USDA food chemists now. And so what you do is you take the flesh, and I want the seed, so I take the seed out very carefully. And then I take the, the, basically the whole berry, and I just slice it in four pieces, and I freeze dry it. And then what we can do is pulverize. The, the freeze drying will basically desiccate the berry. We'll take everything. It, it will leave everything but the water. And so you desiccate the berry. Uh, under cold conditions, so that you don't have like fungus growing or anything. Uh, so you freeze dry it, and then, then you can run it through um, uh, liquid chromatography. They call it HPLC. It's a machine that will basically take the pulverized material. Because then what we do is we just shake it. It becomes it, it pulverizes, and then you run it through um, a solution. Uh, and it gets, it gets separated out, so then you can see how much uh, something called tri uh, something called total acids. You can get like the acidity values for the berries. You can get sugar. 
Um, and ultimately, you really want the ratio of the two. So something that I, that I noticed is, you know, when we were eating these berries, people said, oh, they're tart and, oh, they're sweet. Or, it, it's really a combination of, of sugar and acid that will give you the flavor experience. And so you don't want to get rid of all acid because then it's, you know, then it's just a candy, I guess. And you don't want, you want candy, but it's like, you know, the, to, to get that feeling from a berry, you do need a little bit of that, you know, that acid in there. And so uh, we're, 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 we're basically freeze drying all, that's why I didn't have a, a, a big set to dehydrate because a lot of that fruit I'm saving to get chemical profiles on them. And so then I would know, that's also something that can go into a genetic analysis. So some, some fruit, some plants are gonna make only the blueberry-like type berry, right? Some of them are gonna make only the cranberry-like uh, berry. And so we want, then we wanna know, well, how, does that, how, do they differ, how do they differ from a cranberry or a blueberry? Is it more acidic? Is it a more sweet? And so this will help us uh, determine what the genes are that are regulating some of, that, some of those uh, acids and, and uh, acid and sugar ratios. Yeah, so uh, it's coming along. That's, that's why, you know, I, I, I'm just really thankful that I got to give this talk because the next two years are just going to be like fully research um, and, and really trying to just move this stuff forward um, to help the, the, the cranberry industry and innovate as well. Uh, and so, yeah, well, that's, that's, that's all I have to say about that. Any other questions? Okay, if not, thank you so much. This was a great talk. Thank you.